You're listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. We bring expertise on the international affairs from Stanford's campus straight to you. I'm Michael McFall, the host of World Class and director of FSI. Back in January of this year, Dr. Harold Trincunas, Deputy Director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at FSI, wrote about the political crisis in Venezuela on our Medium blog, in which he described the events surrounding Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro's refusal to step down after Juan Guaido declared himself as the legitimate Venezuelan president. In other words, they have two presidents. Six months later, the crisis has yet to be resolved. Harold has kindly agreed to come on World Class to help us understand exactly what's going on in Venezuela. For those of you who don't recognize Trincunas as a name from Venezuela, he's actually from Venezuela. Originally, his family, I just learned, came from Lithuania. That's why it's Trincunas. And Harold has been writing about Venezuela for decades now, including his first book was called Crafting Civilian Control of the Military in Venezuela. Harold, thanks for being on World Class today. It's a real pleasure to join you today, Mike. So what's going on? <laughs> I have to try. I was going to use an adjective there with an H that my mother would use. But it's a very confusing story. Just help our listeners understand how did we get to this standoff uh, in Venezuela today? Well, Venezuela is in the midst of a very severe economic, social, political crisis. The economy's collapsed by over 50% in the last five years. Poverty's over 90%. Poverty's over 90%. It used to be one of the richest countries in per capita, per capita in, in, right? South in South America. It's a major oil producing country. Right. It had experienced this boom between 2000 and 2012, and until then, Venezuela seemed to be doing pretty well. But now, of course, in the situation where you have you know rising poverty, collapsing economy, the government's got become incredibly unpopular, and for the fear headed by President Maduro. Just so we start getting some of these names in here. Right? Uh, absolutely, the government okay. headed by President Maduro has started becoming quite unpopular. And in fact, in 2015, the opposition won a major major election victory, it swept two-thirds of the seats in Congress. Two-thirds, as you know, from most democracies, is a pretty significant yes. figure. It's a supermajority. Right. This was so threatening to the government that ever since they've headed down a path towards more and more authoritarian rule, and you may wonder why is the government threatened by the possibility of regular right. democratic turnover. Frankly, this is a government that has become increasingly complicit in corruption, drug trafficking, human rights abuses, and for a number of reasons, they fear accountability. So How they, did he get elected? How did Maduro get elected? Though? Well, in 2013, Absolutely. as the boom was close to its peak, right. former President Hugo Chavez died. He was a populist president, very popular in Venezuela, right. rode the commodity boom to its peak, and he died at the right time. He anointed Maduro as his successor. Maduro had first been his foreign minister and then his vice president, and Maduro won a squeaker of an election. There's some credible accusations that there was fraud at the Might time. Stolen, right? I remember that. But that's 2013. That's, that's correct. To our timeline. Right. Okay. And, and the opposition accepted, though, in the spirit of this being a democracy. They, it's a close right. call. They decided to accept the election. But once it was their turn to claim victory, that's when the government decided to take a hard line. And ever since then, they've been trying to marginalize other opposition-controlled bodies in government, particularly the legislature. So they stacked the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. they stacked the National Electoral Council, they've politicized the military and the oil industry, which is a major source of revenues for the government. Right. And finally in 2018, when it was time for Maduro to come up for re-election, they basically committed a range of fraudulent measures around the election so bad that about 50 countries have not recognized Maduro's re-election in 2018. So even before these current protests, that many countries did not recognize the electoral results. Right. They were considered illegitimate, both by the significant part of the international community and also by the opposition. Uh -huh. So what how does... the OAS, Organization uh, of... They have moved increasingly to condemn Venezuela. OAS is interesting because it's a multilateral body. Right. It operates by consensus. Right. Uh, and Cuba's and they, in the organization, right? Well, no, Cuba's oh, not. Cuba's not. Cuba's not. No, but many sorry. countries sympathetic to Venezuela and Cuba are. Got it. Venezuela, when it benefited from its oil largesse, was smart enough to distribute it. <laughs> they handed friend. it out to Nicaragua, <laughs> to many Caribbean countries Got to make it. friends. Got it. And so they have had some protection. But increasingly, the OAS has been coming out to condemn the Venezuelan government. And in fact, the Secretary General is very outspoken I see. on the Venezuela situation today. So the election was many countries didn't recognize it. But then Mr. Guaido declared himself president. president. How did that happen? So Venezuelan constitution provides that if there's a, a vacancy in the presidency, the head of the national legislature, in this case Juan Guaido, takes office temporarily to call for new elections. Uh -huh. This that's is in seems, the Constitution. That's in the Constitution. Now, Maduro obviously doesn't think he's vacated the office, but the opposition operating under the theory that an illegitimate election means that 
office Mad is vacant. Is vacant, basically moved in this direction once Maduro's first term of office uh, ended. So it's a bit of a legal right. theory in play here, right. but the opposition has been able to use this to, again, rally about 50 different countries to I its side. So not only have they not recognized the 2018 presidential election, they have recognized Guaido as right. the acting president. Including the United States, right? Including the United States. Do you know of a historical case where that's happened before? I, I, I was thinking about it. I can't remember a case where you had so many external governments recognize the opposition leader as the new head of state. No, in fact, it's, it's very unusual to have that number. Of course, we can all think of one or two cases, right. separatist republics in right. southern Caucasus, for example, exactly. might have a couple right, right. people recognize them. Exactly. That's a great but case. it's yes. not, like, not. I think Venezuela is one of those countries that recognize I, them. I, I believe you're right. But just the fact that it's 50 countries is really quite unusual. Right. And of course, this is the United States and many of its allies, many Western democracies are in this right. camp. So why has the stalemate lasted so long? It seemed, again, watching episodically that there was about to be a breakthrough and there were a few members of the military that defected, but it's still a standoff. How do you understand that? Well, for one, there's really no constitutional way out of the current situation. Okay. So the Maduro government has basically blocked all possible mechanisms for resolving the present stalemate constitutionally. Okay. So that leads people to look outside institutions, right. such as military conspiracies, right. outside intervention, external diplomatic support, right. to try to find a solution. Some might ask, well, why is, aren't there negotiations? Uh, and in fact, there are negotiations episodically. They're currently have been meeting in Norway to try to look at possible solutions to the crisis. Why Norway? That's interesting. Norway has a history of sponsoring peace and settlements, like including most recent- With and Israelis. Okay. And as well with the Colombia between the government and the FARC, the, the rebel revolutionary okay. forces of Colombia. So, that's so there's a history in the region. In fact, the Venezuelan government participated in those negotiations with huh. Norway. So there's a prior history there. Okay. But the Venezuelan government also has a history of running out the clock using uh -huh. negotiations. Uh -huh. And this means that the opposition doesn't trust them. So there's a lot of dissent among opposition members about whether negotiations are a good idea. So what are the alternatives? Well, that somebody displaces Nicolás Maduro from power. And this physically. is why, physically, which is why you've seen the conspiracy attempt that was revealed on April 30th, for example. Right. I want to hear a little bit more about April 30th, because that seemed like it was going to be this moment, and then it, it faded away. So Correct. And, and in fact, if we there? think back to that moment, not only did Juan Guaido announce that there was this uprising and he called the military to his side, right. we had senior U.S. officials you know, tweeting about it. Yes. Vice President Pence, National Security Advisor John Bolton, right. Senator Marco Rubio. But the armed forces, by and large, stayed on the sidelines. It looks like only about two to three platoons basically those that guarded the Congress, took the side of the National Assembly leader. How and many people is two or three pl platoons? Maybe 100. 100, that's what I thought. Yeah, out of a military of close to 200,000. Did Guaido miscalculate? Did he think there was going to be more defectors? Apparently, there had been a process of negotiation in the weeks leading up to April 30th in which the head of the armed forces, the head of the Supreme Court, and other significant regime figures had apparently agreed to a transition plan which would ease Maduro out and call for new elections. Uh -huh. But it looks like Juan Guaido pulled the trigger too quickly. He claims he thought the plot had been discovered. It may be possible that, of course, the government figures negotiating with the opposition were just playing along to see right. who they could discover, right. which conspirators they might discover. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why the military has been so reluctant to step in. It's actually heavily surveilled by both Venezuelan intelligence services and the Cuban intelligence services that support Nicolás Maduro. That's so who knows whether there was actually a conspiracy going on, or was this just a play to try to discover who the traitors are Got from it. the government's perspective, from Maduro's perspective, right. inside the Venezuelan military. Right. But help us understand your assessment of the military right now. That they basically want to stay on the sidelines? Because so the aren't they a kind of a pivotal player at this moment? Absolutely. In fact, they, they probably are the pivotal player. The military really operates under a couple different constraints. On the one hand, it's gotten a very good deal from Hugo Chavez and then Nicolas Maduro. They've gotten bigger. Their budgets have gotten bigger. They've gotten advanced weaponry pot from Russia and China. Mm -hmm. They now control the oil industry. They control gold mining, another significant source of income, food distribution, fuel distribution, borders, lots of opportunity for self-enrichment. And they've taken full advantage of that. I see. On the other hand... But as the country's been declining, right? As so the country's been declining, increasingly these things look like lemons. But... 
On the other hand, they're also heavily surveilled. If you try to organize against the regime, try to organize a coup, you're likely to be discovered, sent to jail. Your family will be sent to jail. You may be tortured. In fact, some argue that the single largest category of political prisoners in Venezuela today are military personnel. Wow. So hundreds of military personnel currently detained arbitrarily right. by the government. Right. So the trade-off between self-enrichment and going to jail is still right. unresolved, but so far has tended to favor sitting it out. Right. And let's talk a little bit about external actors. You mentioned them a bit, but the Russians, Vladimir Putin supports Maduro. Can you uh, help our, our listeners understand why he would care about Maduro? It seems like a faraway place. Russia's got a lot of other problems. And Absolutely. we'll come back to the Americans. Absolutely. So. Russia's play in Venezuela is twofold. One is it's an oil play, and this is really about Rosneft mm -hmm. and Sechin, Putin's advisor. Who I know. Yes. Uh, who you? <laughs> I used to know him. We you, haven't we haven't been in touch lately. We're not but, Facebook friends. But Sechin is really Putin's point person right. on Venezuela and, they and have Rose, major investments. There, major right? investments. In fact, what they've been doing is picking up properties in Venezuela for pennies on the dollar, counting on the fact that the Venezuelan government, as the economy declines, is desperate for foreign exchange. So they've been increasing their stakes in Venezuela, and they've been lending money to the Venezuelan government essentially by pre-purchasing oil, billions of dollars of oil from Venezuela. Pre-purchasing oil. They're pre-paying for oil. How Instead bizarre. of just lending them money, right. they're basically purchasing oil in advance. I just want to understand the economics. They're a major oil exporter themselves, and yet they're purchasing Venezuelan oil in order to re-export it? Or? Correct. And so from the Russian perspective, the way I understand it is they see Venezuela as an excellent oil play. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world, if you include the ultra-heavy crude. I didn't know that. Okay. Some of this oil is heavy and sour, which right. means it's hard to refine, but it's only 70, 80 kilometers to the coast, as opposed to in Russia where it's 5,000 kilometers of heated right. pipeline to get your oil to markets. Right. So from the Russian perspective, Venezuela's an easy got oil it. play. And it's got large undeveloped reserves, and Western companies are reluctant to invest in Venezuela in the current economic conditions. Because there's sanctions, right? Yes, there's sanctions, but even before that, the government had expropriated a number of Western right. oil companies. So That usually uh, sobers up investors, yes. It certainly does. <laughs> and so, But Russia has had an advantage because okay. of the second part, which is Putin has seen this as a geopolitical right. play. The Russians have sold advanced weaponry to the Venezuelans, S-300 right. air defense missile systems, Suhoi-30 aircraft, T-72 tanks, etc. Putin, I think, it, as he sees the U.S. operating in areas like Syria or Ukraine sees Venezuela as a useful place in which to remind U.S. administrations that uh, Russia can also play even, this game. Even that far away. And the whole regime change thing, which of course Putin says we go around the world doing, and by the way, occasionally we have from time to time, as you know better than I, in that part of the world, but that's another kind of ideological dimension. Absolutely. Like. I mean, for Putin and his advisors, what the U.S. is doing in Venezuela is very much of a piece with the color revolutions, right. Arab Spring, Syria, Libya, and now Venezuela is part of that, and they're, of course, opposed to that. And I have to say that, as we were discussing earlier when we talked about how unusual it was that all these countries were recognizing the head of the legislature as the acting president, I'm sure that the Russians see this as, as a new strategy in yes. the U.S. playbook a great and point. one that they will be thinking about how to counter in the future. Right, because as you went through those, I was thinking about the color revolutions in Serbia 2000, Georgia 2003, Ukraine 2004, and by the way, all the way back to Russia, Soviet Union 1991, were instances where you had two claimants to be the sovereign head of the state. Right. But what was different about them is there wasn't this rush from the international community. Everybody was kind of waiting until it mm -hmm. got resolved. That's what makes this different and more dangerous, I think, from Putin's perspective. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it's interesting that in, in when it comes to U.S. policy, the fact is the, the 50 countries were rolled out pretty quickly. This was not something that was that trial was, and error. It right. was within a day or two of Juan Guaido announcing that he was acting president, you had several dozen countries coming on board alongside the United States to recognize right. Guaido. So clearly there had been already been some work behind the scenes by U.S. diplomats, among others. Which is surprising because the Trump administration doesn't seem very good at those kind of things generally. But let's talk about the U.S. now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's your... 30,000 feet assessment of how they're doing so far in terms of policy, and then I got a couple of specific questions about possible mm -hmm. next steps. So it's interesting. The U.S. has long had a relationship with Venezuela based around Venezuela being a major supplier of oil to the United States. Mm -hmm. so the U.S. has traditionally been 
Venezuela's largest export market, and in fact, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro benefited from that for many, right. many years. Right. But as Venezuela has become increasingly authoritarian, both Republicans and Democrats have been very critical of what's going on in Venezuela, um, and this is a trend that has continued to deepen in the last couple of years. You see this in Congress, not just in the Trump administration. That's a good point. So they see it of a piece with Cuba and Nicaragua and other authoritarian right. governments in the region in a you know, Western Hemisphere that's by and large democratic. Right. So it stands out that this trend, especially since Venezuela was once considered one of the most stable democracies in the right. region. There's been a slow move towards more and more sanctions, initially by the Obama administration, individual targeted sanctions against uh, drug kingpins or human rights abusers or people who'd supported anti-democratic measures in Venezuela. Right. What's different about the Trump administration is they moved to impose oil sanctions. In fact, they've, as of January, imposed full bore every sanction they could basically find. So the sanctions toolkit is basically exhausted in the Venezuela case. So there's no Venezuela, Venezuelan oil coming to America now? Very As of the time. last couple of weeks, they gave, of course, a window for current uh -huh. companies operating in Venezuela to finish purchases and, and contracts. But essentially, it's dried up. I think this is wow. this month is one of the first months where we're not really seeing imports from Venezuela, except through cutouts okay. and third parties, the way the Iranians, for example, have right. made sanctions. So there's okay. that playbook as well. But they're severe then. They're, no, they're quite severe. Uh -huh. And coupled with a declining Venezuelan oil production, Venezuela's oil production has declined from 3 million barrels per day 20 years ago to less than a million barrels per day today. This means that Venezuela is really, really hurting. And we see this in gas shortages, food shortages, medicine shortages, all kinds of different measures. Although those are not just a result of sanctions, that's been going on for about five years. Right. But certainly the impact on the government's income has been severe under the sanctions, but they're still there. Right. They're not departing. In fact, they're starting to do what Iran did when it was sanctioned, which is Go develop around. these right. workarounds, including okay. using Russia and China to try to get around the U.S. sanctions. The U.S. doesn't have a lot of other mechanisms. I mean, diplomacy has been tried. There is a regional coalition uh, called the Lima Group, the right. 12 largest Latin American countries and right. Canada are part of it. They've been trying. There's a Euro EU group that's also trying to pressure Venezuela into democratizing. That hasn't worked very well. I mean, these days we're starting to get calls from some in the Republican Party, certainly Venezuelans in exile, you know, advocating for more forceful military, force. military, measures military intervention in, in Venezuela, which is still being greeted with a lot of skepticism. What um, do you think it, would happen if that were to take place? Well, we have to keep in mind that Venezuela is a country of about 30 million people. It's about the size of the population of Iraq, for example. It's territorially larger than Iraq. It is severely broken economically. Again, as I mentioned, hyperinflation, poverty, declining infrastructure, no reliable electricity or water supply anymore. So a really a broken country. And it also sits on top of some of the largest drug trafficking routes in the world. So this is an Iraq-sized problem with an Afghanistan-sized drug trafficking problem. And those two things combined mean that, A, any kind of intervention would probably be prolonged right. because of the reconstruction period. And the risk that insurgency might develop is most likely higher Pretty than high. other places, especially what we've learned from Afghanistan is that the earnings from drug trafficking are actually an excellent source of funding for insurgencies. And that's available there. And would you have the kind of rally around the flag effect in Venezuela that you see in other countries that are invaded, or would they be welcomed as liberators? I think it's probably more the latter than the former. Uh -huh. I mean, traditionally, Venezuelans are not particularly anti-American. Right. The government's popularity rating is down in like 13, 14 percent. Right. Of course, it depends on sort of how, how the invasion yeah, happened, course. of course. But I think it's, even as we saw in other parts of the U.S. has intervened, it's not the initial intervention that's the issue. It's the prolonged the day after, yes, yeah, of reconstruction period, which allows for periods of mistakes and right. errors and resentments building up. But certainly among Venezuelans abroad, and there's, we have to realize that over 10 percent of the population has fled the country in, the last, know that? in wow. the last few years. Among Venezuelans abroad, there is a real hunger to go home right. and a search for anybody who will help make that happen. Make it happen. So last question, how do you think it ends? <laughs> well, there's three possibilities. One is that much as we've seen in governments like Zimbabwe and Southern Africa, countries that have a dictatorship with access to resources, you figure out how to hold on to power. Or Iran mm -hmm. might be another example. And that's still, I think, a very likely outcome. Mm -hmm. As I said, the armed forces are basically controlled. They control all elements of the government. They've ridden out these sanctions so far. It's a very real possibility. There's a possibility that, of course, the government collapses. They find it is a successful conspiracy. It's a lesser probability in my estimate. And you get some sort of transition to democracy. If that happens, there has been a lot of advanced planning for what would happen on the day after absent an invasion, just okay. if there's a transition. That's in fact, there's a lot of very smart Venezuelans in exile, people at the World Bank or the National Monetary Fund, who on their own initiative, not 
as part of their formal duties and academics and U.S. universities have been talking to each other about what might need to happen to refloat the Venezuelan economy. So I think you try, they try to get a fast start on right. reconstruction right. and try to get the oil industry going again. A flow of income from you know, additional oil production would help refloat the economy. But there's also a real risk of just sort of things collapsing. I mean, uh -huh. Venezuela experienced prolonged electricity blackouts uh, in the last couple months. Food distribution is very uncertain. Things are breaking down. And so there's a real issue that some of the organized crime organizations that are operating in the area, gangs, just break down of social order. And so that might look like a much more complicated situation in which different local actors increasingly take control of the national territory. And you get a nominal government in charge in the capital, but a lot of they regional – That can't govern. And, and sort of regional – militias or strongmen in charge of different parts of the country. So you gave me three possible outcomes, not one, I noticed, <laughs> which means you're probably going to have to come back here and when we get to one of those scenarios, maybe explain what happened. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Thanks, Harold, again for being on World Class. A pleasure to be here with you, Mike. You've been listening to World Class from the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. If you like this episode, please review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners to find the show. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on what's happening in the world and why.